So we're going to launch in. Uh, Stephen uh, brought home the idea that God has pronounced judgment on his people. The Lord who made the covenant, the agreement with them has eventually lost patience and they've, they've again and again tur just turned against him, fl uh, flouted all his rules uh, and they haven't obeyed him and God has said enough is enough and he pronounced judgment against them. Now that kind of thing carries on. Uh, we're starting at chapter 5 verse 8 today. It carries on into chapter 5 verses 8 uh, right through beyond chapter 7. But in this little section we're going to look at today, I want us to pick up, uh, you're still with that judgment theme, pick up the, the many, many pictures that God gives us through Hosea. There's lots of very vivid images here that are that will help us hopefully grasp, not just the, it's easy just to say, well, uh, I know the content. Uh, what we want to do is grasp God's feelings about it, what he, how he despairs. How he longs for his people to turn back. How he longs to forgive them, to love them again. But they're just turning away, refusing every time. So I would launch in at chapter 5 verse 8. Sound the trumpet at Gibeah, the horn at Ramah. Raise the battle cry in Beth Avon. Lead on Benjamin. It uh, almost sounds like, a, let's go boys, let's go and uh, beat these, uh, these cities that, that are against us. But look at the next line. Ephraim will be laid waste on the day of reckoning. Ephraim's the other name for Israel, the northern kingdom. Ephraim will be laid waste on the day of reckoning. You might think you can have a go. It's not going to work. Laid waste. And then we find out God unveils his feelings. It's as if God is saying, let me, I'll let you into a secret. And Hosea reveals God's heart to us. The second line of verse 9, among the tribes of Israel, I proclaim what is certain, that Ephraim will be laid waste. That Judah, verse 10, it doesn't get off lightly, Ephraim and Judah in these early bits of this sermon, they're together uh, almost like a pair. Judah's leaders, verse 10, are like those who move boundary stones. It's like your rich neighbour at uh, one day erecting a fence a couple of metres inside your land. Moving the boundary stone. That's what Judah's leader. They just don't care about other people. They just do what they want. They don't consult. They don't think of what's right or wrong. And God's response, I will pour out my wrath on them like a flood. Now we've seen images of flooding locally and further afield. And it just comes and it comes and nothing can stop it. It turns everything in its path. God's judgment will come like a flood of water. Ephraim, verse 11, is oppressed, trampled in judgment, but, or maybe because, she's intent on pursuing idols. Why is this judgment coming? Well, just God reminding us, she chose to go after gods that wouldn't and couldn't help. To use sticks, as Diane showed us last week, to find out the way to go. God says, verse 12, two lovely images here. I'm like a moth. God saying he's like a moth. Now that's not flitting about. What he means, I'm a moth, is I'm biting, eating, eating away at your substance. I'm like rot to the people of Judah. One day it'll just be dust. It'll all be gone. Now verse 13 suddenly feels positive. Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah his sores. Again, the two north and southern kingdoms paired together. They see the problems. They're recognising. Isn't that brilliant? Isn't that how things should start? We realise our sin. We realise when things aren't going right. We face it. But it's not a point of hope. Look at the next line. Verse 13, Ephraim saw his sickness, due to his sores, and then Ephraim turned to the big country next door, Assyria, and sent to the great king for help. But of course he's not able to cure, he's not able to heal your sores. God's almost saying to him, why turn to him? What's he got? How can he help? And the irony of it is that in not too many decades later, 
Assyria is the one who will trample you to pieces and disperse you throughout the world. It's a sad picture. Verse 14 continues to be a sad picture. God has said, I'm like a moth, I'm like rot. Now he says, I'm like a lion. Not a wonderful, majestic lion defending its, its, its uh, little ones. God says, I'll be like a lion to Ephraim, like a great lion to Judah. I will tear them to pieces. It's not just Assyria. God himself will go on the offensive against his own beloved people. Now verse 14 uh, to, verse, to chapter 6 verse 1. Uh, think of this lion imagery. I'll read 14 again. For I will be like a lion to Ephraim, says the Lord, like a great lion to Judah. I'll tear them to pieces and go away. So he, he, he kills them and there's this carcass lying there and he goes away. He says, I will carry them off. There'll be no one to rescue them. I will return to my lair until they have borne their guilt and seek my face. In their misery, they will earnestly seek me. See, God's intention is not to, to stamp down and destroy. God's intention is to bring them to the point of looking for him to help, of coming back to him, of knowing that he is their hope, he is their peace. And chapter 6 verse 1 opens with a, ah, brilliant, come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, he has been the lion fighting against us, but he'll heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind our wounds. After two days, he'll revive us. On the third day, he will restore us. That we may live in his presence. Now, this is what the only place in the Old Testament where it talks of rising on the third day, restored to life on the third day, resurrection on the third day, if you like. Now, it means obviously here, uh, the people, or Hosea speaking for the people, saying, well, God won't leave us forever. In the second or third day, he'll come back. It's a metaphorical, it's picture language. But uh, we have to see here and notice that these are the kind of things when Paul said that Jesus would, would rose from the dead according to Scripture. This is the kind of verse that Paul would have had in mind. So there's a little kind of hidden uh, seed of something pointing us to Christ. What is our hope? That God will raise us. And if he doesn't raise us, there is no hope. So this is what they're saying. After two days he'll revive us, and the third day he'll restore us, that we may live in his presence. Let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to know him. It, it's, it's repentance, basically, not in, in those words. As surely as the sun rises, he will appear. He will come like the winter rains, like the spring rains that water the earth. One, two, three days in verse two. Now we have one, two, three rains uh, from the season, the early rain to get the seed ready for the sowing. So I get the ground ready to sow the seeds, to take the seeds. Uh, then the next rains, the winter rains to, to help the, the plants grow. And then the summer rains, what they long for, and then the terrible long summer of no rain. They long for these showers uh, to bring a bit of life and hope. And they're saying, as surely as that happens, God will come to us. Just as two follows one and three follows two, just as these rains follow each other season after season, God will come. It would be nice if the book of Hosea stopped here, if this was the end. But it's not the end. Look at verse 4. And notice again that it's not just Ephraim, it's not just the northern kingdom that had turned against God in a very obvious, deliberate way. It's also the southern kingdom, Judah, which felt it was following God. What can I do with you, Ephraim? What can I do with you, Judah? Your love is like the morning mist. Like the early dew, it disappears. They talked of rain, God's constancy, like the rain. And they even uh, talked of God coming and giving life to them. And God 
someone says, you want to talk about rain? Your kind of love for me is like, not like rain that is powerful and gives life. Your kind of rain is, is the rain that disappears on the first thing in the morning. Your love is like the morning mist, like the early dew that disappears. And God goes back on his own theme. Therefore, now, very graphic language, but see that the, the tool he uses, I cut you in pieces with my prophets. I killed you with the words of my mouth. God is saying, I'm going to speak to you and that will destroy you. I'm going to speak because my words of judgment are following words of hope and promise. My words of judgment are sure and you will be destroyed by these words of judgment. Now the last line of verse 5, then my judgments go forth like the sun. As constant as they had hoped God's blessing would be, God says that's what my judgment will be like. And then verse 6, he, he gives the reason, and this is a very famous, well-known verse. He says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. Now, just pause here for a moment. Verse 4, in the middle of verse 4, God says, your love is like the morning mist. Now, that's exactly the same word as the word mercy in, in verse 6. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And it's the word, it's the, it's the word that is used throughout the Old Testament for God's covenant love. This covenant, this binding agreement he made with them to save them, to rescue them. He said, I will bring you out of slavery, give you a land of milk and honey, the land of promise. You will be safe, secure with me forever. So follow me, obey me. That was the covenant, the loving kindness of God, the covenant love of God. That's what that's what's, uh, the word God uses here. But he, but now he's talking about their love. See, verse 4, it says, your love is like the morning mist. It's not the strong love committed for good forever that I give you. That's what I'm looking for from you, but that's not what I'm getting. I'm getting love that disappears at the first dawn of light. I desire, verse 6, that kind of love, the loving kindness from the covenant. Not sacrifice, not not grand gestures, not the, the big the big uh, religious ceremony, not the big um, emotional outburst, not the thing that seems to indicate your your commitment to me. But loving kindness, this covenant love that is deep and lasts forever. That's what I look for. The acknowledgement or probably the knowing of God, knowing God, rather than a sacrifice which is meant to show it. But if, it, if it's not revealing that love, then it's a waste of time. God wants from us, from them, this bond of love, this loving kindness, which he has showered on us. He wants that to be our response. Not the religious or the, or, or even the kind of the outward things which reveal morality or religion. He wants the heart that says to God, you're everything. You've saved us, you've given us life, you've promised us life, glory after glory. And we will come to you uh, humbly to receive it, because we don't deserve it. And we'll come and we will love you in return. That's what God is looking for. So we can take a little breath here and I think we can reflect uh, and say, well, uh, God's not being harsh. He's not being picky. He's given them centuries to receive his love and return it. And they've constantly refused again and again. And it's time now for judgment. And he's not speaking to pagans. He's not speaking to Assyria or any other nation. He's speaking to his own people. If you like the non-religious or those who are more nominal as well as the those who are more devoted more religious and isn't that right for us doesn't that speak to us god saying to us it's not just um, the outward things it's not just a show it's got to be real it's got to be a loving kindness like i showed you 
That's a challenge for me. It's a challenge I imagine for, for each one of you watching this. Am I willing to say to God it's, that look inside my heart, look at what's going on, look at the, expose the truth of my what's going on in me, my motivations, my uh, my actions, my inside thinking as well as my outside action and speaking. And is it a response of loving kindness to God? And if not, I need to come humbly in repentance and use the words of maybe uh, six, chapter 6 verses 1 to 3 use those genuinely from the heart not in a flippant way presuming on God's mercy ok we're now at um, chapter 6 verse 7 uh, it's more of the same really um, it says as at Adam they have broken the covenant they were unfaithful to you. now it could be uh, instead of as at Adam, it could be but like Adam, meaning Adam and Eve, Adam. And now that fits well, and um, I think in terms of the original, that, that does make sense. Like Adam, they have broken the covenant. They were unfaithful to me. Their God was, Adam was unfaithful to God in Eden. So they're repeating Adam's sin, or maybe at a place called Adam, they broke the covenant. Verse 8, Gilead is a city of evildoers. Now, picture this again. Imagine just a city, a town in, in Israel. Uh, mud brick houses, perhaps. Uh, plenty of people around. Lots of dust, dry. And uh, footprints, uh, dust from the footprints. And here, God looks at this city uh, in Gilead or of Gilead and says... What kind of footprints am I seeing? The footprints of murderers. Footprints of blood. As marauders lie in ambush for a victim. So bands of priests. The religious leaders, they're the ones, the murderers on the road to Shechem. All the leadership murderers. They're carrying out at the end of verse 9 their wicked schemes. I've seen a horrible thing in Israel. God is now laying, almost laying bare his, his frustration, his, his sadness. I've just seen it, he says. Murder on the streets of my towns, my cities. Ephraim, verse 10, has given, is given to prostitution. Israel is defiled. Also for you, Judah, a harvest is appointed. Not just Ephraim, but Judah as well. It's the last mention of Judah in our passages, but God wants to say, Judah, don't you smirk at their judgment. You're not much different. God sees a horrible thing in Israel. Murder, uh, priests just doing their own thing, uh, getting what they want, no morals whatsoever. Prostitution, adultery, and Israel, it says the end of verse 10, is defiled. Now that's a, it's almost like a, a final Stephen's gavel punching on the desk last week. It's almost like a final thing saying, right, that's it. Israel's defiled. In the Old Testament law, uh, you're defiled. If you've done some sin, you're defiled. You're excluded until the repentance or the amount of days needed for that defilement to go. You're excluded. You're out of the covenant. You're under the curse. Defilement is almost like a word of judgment. Then verse 11, Judah a harvest is appointed. That's again a picture, a field for harvest, reaping the terrible judgment. A curse is coming and sweeping away all the grain, taking it all away. The sadness of God uh, continues at the end of verse 11. Whenever I would restore the fortunes of my people, God expressing a desire for their, their blessing. When I would restore the fortunes, whenever, 7 verse 1, whenever I would heal Israel, what do I see? Instead, I go down to look and all I see is what comes to the surface. The sins of Ephraim, the crimes of Samaria, the capital of, of the northern kingdom. What do I see when I look at their activity? Thieves, bandits. Nowhere is safe. My 
city of the promised land, the towns I have given you, the habitat of thieves and murderers. Verse 2, but they don't realise that I'm watching. They don't realise that I'm counting their evil deeds. I remember them all. Their sin, their sins engulf them, but yet they're always before me. They're drowned in them so they can't see it, but I see it. The sins engulf them. That's again a very vigorous picture. Seeing they're so sucked into it, that's the life they live. They cannot see how evil they are. Now, let me just pause again here because this is, again, I think it strikes home at us. There are some times when you, you move into a certain lifestyle or, or uh, delve into a certain sin or move in certain company so that their language, their feelings, the things they watch, the things they do become normal. And other people perhaps can see but you can't, that things are changing. I remember, this was years and years ago, I was playing the church football team when I was probably 22, 23, and the guy was the captain, a really nice guy, um, seemed to be a good Christian. I remember the first time I ever heard him swear in the football field, and I just kind of noted it, slightly sad, but within a year he'd lost his faith, he'd given up on Jesus. And that seemed to me just it was a it was a mark of the company that he'd been keeping the kind of um, he was he was um, he was a teacher he was, he was spending more time with other teaching staff and so on and he was drawn away and he didn't see it at that time I think we don't realise we're being drawn in but we no we would realise if we went back to the Bible and read read these words, read God's word to us, if we feed ourselves what God says over against what our friends or the world we're living in says, then we will see with God's eyes rather than be engulfed in the world we're living in. Okay, um, sorry we're just walking through this uh, in order, but it seems to me that's a good way to do it because there's so much, uh, image, so many images here that, that, are, that we can pick up on. So we're now chapter 7 verse 3. Now here we're introduced to the king and the princes. They delight the king with their wickedness, the princes with their lies. Now the word wickedness is the same as the word evil in verse 2, evil deeds. So that's the link. Uh, these people are doing these evil deeds not realising they're engulfed in the sin. And the king and the princes, they love it. They're delighted. Those who rule the land, they're at the forefront, they're part of it all. See, there's, there's this doubling the king and the princes. And then the image suddenly changes, verse 4, they're all adulterers burning like an oven. Now, you can picture that image, adultery and oven, whose fire the baker need not stir from the kneading of the dough till it rises. Now, I think the image here is uh, the, the baker, think of a kind of pizza oven, perhaps the baker prepares the fire uh, in the oven and it's there. He doesn't need to stir it, it's there. But but it's, it's almost as if it's saying when, when adultery and, and sexual desire is like this, it, it, keeps, it keeps flaming itself. It doesn't need someone else to stir it. It's there all the time feeding itself. And the king and the princes are just freely indulging, leading the way. Verse 5, on the day of the festival of our king, the prince has become inflamed with wine and he joins hands with the mockers. Now whether this is a particular instance or just a general idea that um, you know, plenty of drink, plenty of times when people just let everything hang loose. And uh, the mockers, the others, all those, the cynics are there. Their hearts, back to this uh, oven image again, their hearts are like an oven. They approach him with intrigue, perhaps approach the king. Their passion smoulders all night. In the morning it blazes like a flaming fire. Now you see again, it doesn't need something to arouse the flame. It's there all the time, all the way through. So the king and the princes, then the oven. We've got the king and the princes again in verse 5, and now again the oven. And I just remember, you, most of you be too, well many of you too uh, young for this, but when I was a kid at home, uh, we had a fire, and that fire, the back boiler, so the water was kept hot in the back boiler under the cold fire. 
and at night, every time at night, uh, we'd stack the fire and put these kind of wet, small bits of coal on the fire, just pile it on so it went all uh, smoky. And that kept it in all night, just smouldering quietly, so that in the morning you stirred it and it came back into flame again. Uh, end of verse 6, their, the, their passion smoulders all night. It's there, but it's, it's just, but then in the morning it flames up like a flaming fire. All of them are hot as an oven. They devour their ruler. And then back to the king and the princes again. The ruler, all their kings fall and none of them calls on me. Starts off with them loving it. It ends up with them falling. The height of their prominence, their excitement, their joy, their, their uh, enjoyment of their power. And in the end, those things destroy them. Facade isn't at the end of verse 7. All their kings fall and none of them calls on me. God is saying, I'm here. I've offered myself again and again. I'm here. They don't call. They don't come to me for the help that I would give them. It's an important picture of this because it's saying that those who have authority and power, it's so easy to, to enjoy that, to, to live in that kind of life, to lose a sense of what really is going on. And then you open your eyes one day and find it's too late. You've lost the privilege that you had in that position of power. And you didn't see that God could have got you out of it. You shut your eyes to it. Verse 8. Ephraim mixes with the nations. Ephraim is a flat loaf not turned over. Now this is two little pictures here and it's probably just picking up the idea of the baker and the oven. Ephraim mixes with the nations. Like you're, mixing, you're, you're mixing your dough to make a cake or something. And Ephraim is mixing with what? With Not with the good stuff, with the bad stuff. Ephraim is mixing with those who don't belong to the Lord. So that there's, a, there's, a, there's two things which don't fit. It can only end in disaster. The next little image, Ephraim is a flat loaf not turned over, burnt on one side, uncooked on the other. It's not right. It's not good. It doesn't taste right. It's not what you're after. It's a failure. Foreigners, this is, this is what's behind it. Foreigners sap his strength and he doesn't see it. You see, this picks up from what we've seen before. Blindness. Foreigners sap his strength, he doesn't realise it. His hair is sprinkled with grey, but he doesn't notice. Now, if I wore a toupee and uh, coloured my uh, hair, my beard, you'd just laugh, wouldn't you? Saying he doesn't want to get old. This poor king, these poor princes, they think they're in their prime, but actually they're on the way out. They think things are going well, but they're blind. They're not seeing it. Verse, uh, what's that? Verse 10, Israel's arrogance testifies against him. But despite all this, and again it's God standing there saying, come to me, he does not return to the Lord his God or search for him. Almost this moment of this, this heightened crisis of power where he thinks in his prime but actually it's almost the end. God is saying, I was here. I am here. Turn and look. Come to me. The judgment picture is coming back. Verse 11. Ephraim is like, again, God sadly observing this. Ephraim is like a dove. Easily deceived and senseless, now calling to Egypt, now calling to Assyria, flitting from one to the other. Uh, when they go, God says, I will throw my net over them. I will pull them down like birds in the sky. When I hear them flocking together, I'll catch them. They're not going to get help from there. They're not going to get away with thinking they can do without me, thinking they can have what I offer and refuse me. I will catch them. Woe to them, verse 13, because they have strayed from me. Destruction to them, because they have rebelled against me. But still, the end of verse 13, God hasn't forgotten why, what he's doing, 
he's not so engulfed in his anger that he can't see what he really wants. I long, he says, to redeem them, but they speak about me falsely. They don't cry out to me from their hearts. <laughs> they wail on their beds, they slash themselves. They're, they're kind of emotionally kind of involved in something. They're trying to get life to go well. They're trying to get themselves sorted. They appeal to their gods for grain and for new wine, but they turn away from me. It's as if when they look, they look with blind eyes when they look towards God, but they look around them at these other things that are useless or destructive to them, that do them no good. Verse 15, God says, I trained them. I strengthened their arms. But when it comes to me, they plot against me. They don't turn to the Most High. They're like a faulty bow. Think of a, a bow and arrow, pathetic bow that it starts and just doesn't make it. It doesn't reach its goal, its target. They're pathetic. They think they're trying to get to God, but it, it's, they're, not, they're not really doing it. They're not really interested. Their leaders will fall as a the result. They'll fall by the sword because of their insolent words. They'll be ridiculed in the land of Egypt. The place they go for help, they'll be laughed at. What a fall from their king is delights in the wickedness to his blind, to his grey hairs, to his ridiculed by the nation he seeks help from. So that's uh, yeah, the, the end of our passage. So just kind of draw things finally together. What's your overall feeling? It's sadness, isn't it? Isn't it a sense of, if only they had looked up, if only they had not been blind, if only they had seen beyond their noses. God was there. Uh, verse the end of uh, five fifteen. In their misery, they will earnestly seek me. Six eleven. Whenever I would restore the fortunes of my people, to what I wants to do. Uh, end of thirteen. I long to redeem them, but they don't cry out to me from their hearts. God is looking to us and saying, "Come to me." Whatever situation, if you're feeling engulfed. Come to me, even if you're if it, if you're so engulfed you can't see, but there's a little light, a little kind of something. Come to me, he says. If you sense uncertainty, you don't want to go that way. Come to me. That's the answer. Come to me, he says. Earnestly seek me. Use the words of six verse one. I'm going to finish with these words uh, as I pray, not to use them blandly as it seems Israel did then, but so they can be genuine expressions of what's in our hearts, words that we can then put put life to from within. God is longing for us to come to him. What's what's stopping you? Let's pray. Come let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces but he will heal us. He has injured us but he will bind up our wounds. After two days he will revive us. On the third day and uh, we thank you Lord for this wonderful just hint of resurrection on the third day he will restore us that we may live in his presence let us now acknowledge the lord let us press on to acknowledge him as surely as the sun rises he will appear he will come to us like the winter rains like the spring rains that water the earth father we thank you for these words may they express what's going on inside us, the genuine desire of our hearts. And may that turn into deliberate, dedicated changes and commitments through the power of your Spirit to follow you. Thank you, Father, that you have not finally and forever closed the door. Thank you that you stand offering, you come to us to offer this life. And thank you, Father, that this picture of resurrection is there before us too that uh, at the final day when everything else has gone when all the sufferings are over that we will be raised with Christ immortal into your glorious promised land Father come to us we pray in the name of our resurrected Lord Jesus Amen <laughs>